How countries like Australia can harness the financial challenges and opportunities of climate change was the subject of a public lecture by UNSW's Dr Mike Molitor. Here's an excerpt from that lecture. Here are some definitions of success in my view. One is um, we're going to get new carbon leadership in the White House. Uh, a new president will be inaugurated in January 2009. And whether it's McCain or Obama or, or Clinton, it appears that, at least in terms of what they're saying, um, we're going to see new leadership on this, on this issue. What that translates to um, in terms of support for the legislation that's moving through the US Congress remains to be seen. But clearly, in the absence of this, um, we're not going to make much progress. The United States emits about 25% of all the greenhouse gases in the world. Um, we can't do this without the US. Copenhagen Protocol, um, which with any luck will be adopted in Copenhagen next year. That's the end of this Bali process. Um, I think we need a, 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 a stringent 2020 target to, write, to send the right target, uh, message to the, to the market. Um, we need to find a way to get China and India involved. We need access to those emissions opportunities, like Australia. China and India have large pools of low-cost abatement opportunities. We should, if we have access, if this agreement gives us access to that, we will move capital. And the question is how to get them in in a way that allows them to preserve their right to increase their, their economies. Um, and uh, ca you know, c capital provisions. Really thinking about how can we structure an international agreement that recognizes that trend and accelerates it. Um, accelerate movement towards car market. Australian success. Um, Ross Garno, economics professor at ANU and advisor to the Rudd government, most of you know if you're in this room in a climate change talk, he's going to issue a report um, in two parts, um, maybe in July and September on that time scale, the economics of climate change for Australia. And one of the things he's going to talk about is what would be a meaningful target for Australia. We have a trajectory that we have to follow for Kyoto because we're a Kyoto party. But the Kyoto trajectory is meaningless relative to 2020. It's not the right trajectory. We're going to need a much steeper trajectory to meet any meaningful target for 2020. And of course, Penny Wong, our new um, climate change minister, is also going to issue a green paper. We need, in my view, we need the, this process. This is very important. A, 2020, a stringent 2020 target is important. Um, leadership in the Copenhagen negotiations. We have an unprecedented opportunity to be the bridge that helps China. Right. We've got investments by China into our resource companies. Um, Penny Wong has made some inroads in terms of the recent trip with, with the, the, the PM there. We could show dramatic leadership in this particular issue, and we have leverage on this issue. It's absolutely critical. China, India, and the United States have got to be players in this Copenhagen game. Robust emissions trading scheme with real carbon prices and flexible approaches. Right? There's discussion about whether or not we're going to compensate companies with loss of asset values or give them free allowances. Um, when I say real prices, there's a carbon price. If the price is too low in our system, no one's going to invest in improving our carbon productivity. They'll simply just pay the fines and emit. If the price is too high, we're going to potentially damage the economy. So there's a sweet spot. There's a right number. Garno seems to be suggesting that number's closer to $40. At $40 a ton, we change the entire shape of the Australian economy, even at $25 a ton. If it's $40 a ton, um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty real number. The flexible approach is, is let's give those Australian companies that have few abatement opportunities, let's give them the flexibility of using abatement carbon credits and reductions occurring elsewhere in the Australian economy and elsewhere worldwide. We have to give those guys, we have to buy them some time. Unless we don't want to fly or unless we don't want to use energy, um, it's a, ultimately a question about buying time for them. And then finally, um, Australasian carbon finance and carbon trading leader. Sydney is the world's first. We have a Silicon Valley where I, come, where I used to come from. In my new home, um, we threw this idea around a, a carbon harbor. If there's $37.5 trillion chasing this problem, Right. And let's think about it. We're exporting. We're the largest exporter of, uh, net exporter of coal in the world. We've got a lot of uranium. We sit between China and, and, and the United States uh, more than just geographically. Um, I believe that we are in a, in a position to be a carbon energy economic superpower. Right? And that will depend on the structure of this regime. Because we can move capital. We've got one and a half trillion dollars, I think, in superannuation with the prediction that it's going to double. We've got plenty of capital. We've got great technology. 
Um, you know, we've got the kind of um, property rights in political institutions and legal institutions. We can move into this space as well, if not faster than anybody else. For more information or to contact Dr Molitor, go to the UNSW Climate Change Research Centre website at www.ccrc.unsw.edu.au.